It's my uh, delight to introduce Sarah Bentley Allred to all of you. Um, this is like the moment when like all of your cool friends meet at the same place. So I first met Sarah when she was a student at Virginia Theological Seminary. Um, and I was doing some different digital projects for VTS um, over the years. So I've known Sarah as a student and then as a graduate, uh, worked with her on a website called Building Faith uh, and seeing her ministry and leadership just um, bloom in so many ways. So um, I'm really excited for UDLC to get to meet Sarah and vice versa. She's heard a lot about you. Um, so Sarah's a graduate of a Virginia Theological Seminary. And she's the editor, editor for Building Faith, which is buildfaith.org. Um, and she's very coolly the convener of Forma, which is the network for Christian formation for the Episcopal Church uh, and beyond. And um, Sarah was introduced to Godly Play when she worked in a church after college, which I think is High Point, North Carolina, right? That's where I went to college. We didn't meet then, but that's where I went to college. Um, and so um, I've seen Sarah lead Godly Play and um, introduce Godly Play at Virginia Seminary and help equip leaders in Godly Play. Um, and now she's a, a certified trainer in Godly Play. And so she's a she's an advocate for children's spiritual lives and faith formation and has a real uh, wonderful gift for for Godly Play. And during the pandemic, uh, Sarah did Godly Play on videos for her congregation. So we were all, you know, having to go virtual and figure out what that was like. And I, I is very soothing to watch Sarah do godly play lessons on YouTube during the pandemic. Uh, so that was a, a great experience. I got to see her in sort of action, you know, uh, in that way, because we don't always get to see each other in ministry. So very excited for you all to meet and for Sarah to share her experiences about uh, godly play with us. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, and I was recalling over dinner, I think my husband and I did visit at one point and come to worship a couple years back. So um, it's just a joy to continue to cross paths with um, Keith and with y'all in various ways over the years. Um, so we are here to talk about godly play, uh, the big kind of overview picture. So I'm going to um, do my best to keep it to 30-ish minutes, and that way um, we can zoom in on some of the things that are most important to you guys. So I'll start with um, a little bit of the, the background and the roots of godly play. It was developed by Jerome Berryman, an Episcopal priest who studied with a woman named Sophia Cavaletti, who founded another Montessori-based Christian formation program called Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. And both of these um, ways of being with children or curriculums are, are really rooted in the tradition of Montessori. So anybody who has experience with Montessori will find um, a lot of familiarity in godly play. So here's kind of a couple things I would say right off the bat about godly play. Uh, first, it assumes that children already have a relationship with God. So in godly play, we are not trying to fill up the child with knowledge about God, um, like an empty vase or the blank slate. We believe that there is already something happening between the child and something larger. And so what we're doing is supporting the child in learning religious language to articulate their experience. In Godly Play, adults in the room are mentors, guides, and mutual learners, rather than we don't usually call them a teachers um, because we want to represent the way that the learning and the wisdom flows between the adult and the child not just from uh, the adult to the children. So for example, we even sit in a circle and the Godly Play Storyteller will, will sit on the floor at the level of the children as one symbol for that mutual learning um, rather than being up in front of the room or standing above the children. Godly Play offers a prepared environment. I'll talk a little bit more about the Godly Play um, space and the classroom in a little bit. 
Um, it uses a model of discovery learning. So the idea is instead of um, sort of distilling information and trying to transfer it to the child, we have an experience together and then we reflect on that experience together and support each other in the meaning making process. Um, so our hope is that we don't we don't give a lot of uh, answers in Godly Play, I would say, but we create uh, environments and experiences where children can discover and wonder. And so through this process, which I'll go into a little bit of how like a session would flow, um, one of the biggest components is supporting that development of religious language, which uh, sounds kind of highbrow and it took me a while to really uncover even for myself, what does it mean that in godly play we're developing religious language? And I think it's simply like the ability to um, to have some knowledge of our faith stories, to have some knowledge of the symbols, the colors, the gestures that are happening in worship and liturgical spaces. And then to be able to use those things to talk about God, to think about God, to communicate with other people. So Godly Play is child-centered. We trust the child and what's their relationship with God, what's happening for them in the experience. And we trust um, the process of godly play and that experience, even when we don't 100% uh, know or understand what's happening for the child. This story that you see here in the picture um, is the Advent story. It's one of the liturgical action stories from godly play. Um, this story that you'll see here is the Ark and the Flood. So there are a lot of ways to do godly play. This is what uh, sort of a typical session by the book with an hour or an hour and a half of time might look like. So the first piece is getting ready. And that really starts as soon as the child um, like comes into the hallway, wherever the space is. So there's a lot of preparation that happens even in that hallway space with somebody called the door person who meets the child or the whole family and helps that child get ready to enter in, to cross the threshold into the godly place space. When they cross in, they'll have um, a door. Uh, they'll cross in and they'll see the storyteller already um, sitting in a circle, ready for them to enter. And they might have a little bit of conversation. And when the group is gathered, it will be time uh, for the storyteller to present the lesson. And there are different types of godly play stories. Um, most of them are uh, scripture based, and then there are some liturgical stories like the Advent story, the circle of the church year, um, a story about baptism, those types of stories. After the lesson is presented, then storyteller and the children wonder together about that story. So the storyteller might say, I wonder what part of this story you liked best and leave some space for responses. Um, and then the storyteller will ask one at a time, each child, what they are going to start with for their response time. And there will be a time of open um, work time or response time. We use those terms interchangeably. And so there's a lot of options. Um, in this picture, this child is engaging in the response time and they pulled a story off the shelf that they'd heard before and that they wanted to set up and work with, manipulate for themselves. So you can always work with a story. And there's a lot of art response materials that you could also work with. And as storytellers, we work hard to um, support the children and finding something meaningful to work with and then not interrupt to allow them to have that time and space to reflect on the story and to be with God. After about 10 or 15 minutes, depending on how much time you have, um, the storyteller will signal that it's time to put all of our work away and come back to the circle for the feast. And so we gather in a circle, 
the children help pass out um, water and napkins and a small amount of food, like two or three crackers, a few pieces of popcorn. Um, we pray together. That can look different depending on the practice of your circle. Sometimes people uh, go around the circle and say what they're thankful for. Sometimes a child says a prayer. And then we share a feast together and, and we chat. When we have cleaned up the feast and our time is coming to a close, then we'll have a dismissal um, and each child will receive a blessing. Um, and that might be something to the effect of, um, Keith, would you like to come forward for your blessing? I see that your parents are here. It was so wonderful to be with you today. Thank you for your work. Um, may you always know that God is with you wherever you go. And then the child will reunite with their um, parent or adult. So you can you can see that it is um, a, a flow of a session that actually mimics what worship might be like in, in many Christian contexts. There's um, a crossing into that sacred space. There's scripture. There's times of response. There's a feast together. And then there's a way to depart going out. So this is one example of a godly playroom. Every church is going to have a different size and configuration of space with the windows in different places and different type of shelving. Um, but there are some things that will be sort of typical. Um, so you'll notice that everything has a place in a godly playroom. Um, the stories are actually set up in order. Can you see like a little blue dot? If I move that around on my screen or my only thing, you can see the blue dot. Okay. So like over here would actually be the story of creation. And then the next one is the Ark and the Flood, Sarah and Abraham, the Ten Commandments. So the stories are actually set up in chronological order according to how they would appear in the Bible. And so over the course of time, if a child spends three, five, seven years in a godly playroom, they learn. Um, where these stories go, and they're actually learning the arc of the Bible and where things fit in that narrative based on how the room is constructed. Um, so these top, the top shelf are stories that like three to six year olds would hear probably multiple times. You might have um, at my own parish where I am a godly play storyteller. We have all these shelves and the lower uh, shelving is, is a little bit empty, actually. We have kind of just the top level stories and that will serve us for about two or three years. Our young people are, are hearing those core stories every year, creation, um, the liturgical story of Advent, the faces of Easter, kind of over and over again. And then as they get older, they're ready to add extension lessons, which are like down here on these shelves. So um, again, it's in order. So up here, you might have the story of Sarah and Abraham and the great family. And then lower down, you might hear a story just about Sarah that goes into more detail about Sarah's life. Um, so it's a spiral curriculum, which builds a layer upon layer um, as, as the children grow and develop. You can also see here on the wall, this is the circle of the church year. It's felt and this arrow is movable. So we can every week move the arrow around the circle and help the children sort of tie in the pieces of what's happening in worship um, and liturgically. This is zooming in on on the focal shelf just so that you can see the materials a little bit more clearly. Um, this is the story of the Holy Family. It's one of our, our focal stories, uh, the Good Shepherd and World Communion, and over here is baptism. So you'll notice that these are high quality materials and we believe that says something to the children about their value um, when we have beautiful high quality materials in our space. Everything is organized. Um, 
And these materials are for the children. So if there is something that's fragile, we work on learning how to care for that, how to carry it with two hands, how to put it back where it goes. After the story, actually part of the lesson is putting everything back um, the way that it goes. And that's explicitly part of um, the Godly Play presentation. So that's the big, the big picture um, pieces, I think. Okay, these are going into your question. So I wanna pause there. I do have some slides that might correspond with Deborah's um, questions in a minute. Uh, Deborah's put together a few kind of frequently asked questions that we've been hearing. Um, so I'd love her to um, share those kind of on behalf of, of the congregation and, and get Sarah's take on those. And then we'll open it up to, uh, to conversation and more questions. All right. So the first question uh, that we've been hearing is, how is Godly Play different from a typical Sunday school lesson? Okay. So in Godly Play fashion, if it's okay, <laughs> and Reagan and Stephanie, who are here, you don't have to say anything, but to maybe Keith and Deborah, did you notice anything in the first part of the presentation that stood out to you about how Godly Play might be different? And then I'll add to what you noticed. You wanted us to uh, chime in? If, you, if you're willing. Sure. I Well, I saw a lot of similarities to some of the lessons that I, I had done in, in years past. Um, but one thing that stood out to me was um, choice, children's choice in their response time. Usually we would have a craft or activity planned, and then everybody more or less participated in that um, activity. And it sounded like, in this case, the response time was much more individualized. Yeah. Well said. Um, I, I think uh, you know the the image of the room, and we're working on we're creating a godly play room uh, um, right now. Actually, in one of the old Sunday school classrooms. So actually, physically, the difference between the room with the tables and chairs and lots of stuff and lots of paper and things that went up high, you know, and we're bringing everything down to more of a child's level um and that the storyteller sits and so everything is child-sized and is like prioritizing children's voices and experience and um you know i, I read ahead so um, so there are other things that you may have not talked about but that are in the book um the godly play book so i, I really like that and, and my kids um did it was reggio Emilia nursery school or preschool so it's similar to montessori that kind of discovery and um, and being um, kind of a a, a, sh a sharer in discovery and learning uh, that as a parent helper when we'd be in there once a month was really neat to experience. So kind of brought a lot of those feelings back. Absolutely. Yeah, for me, I feel like one of the main things that stick out, even just thinking back to when I was a kid in Sunday school, is like when you were asked questions, there was always like a right answer. You know, it's like a quiz or you, you know, so what was the name of this person or what, you know, when did this happen? So that seems like another big difference from what asking a question to gain this kind of random biblical knowledge versus the like wondering question. So I, all of that, and there's so much more to say about, you know, the differences. When I was, I got these questions ahead of time. So I cheated a little bit. So just the three that Deborah is going to ask me. Um, but um, this is kind of what came to, to my mind too off the top of my head that really fits in with everything y'all said. Um, I think trust in the child's spiritual, innate spirituality is a really big difference in godly play. I, I think a lot of Sunday school curriculums in a traditional model, like they kind of assume that the child, that they are the ones imparting everything that the child needs. And we're just starting from a different point, thinking like the child is already in relationship with God. We don't have to manage that piece for, for the child or for God. So it's a different like starting point and different orientation 
um, towards what's happening in that room and during that that time. And I would say also that godly play is oriented towards process, not product. So back to Reagan, what you were saying about the choice and the response time versus more of a craft, like I've had a situation in godly play where week after week, a very young child chose for their work time paper cutting. And this child would, would just sit there with the construction paper and the scissors and just cut strips of paper. Cut, cut, cut. And at the end of godly play, they would proudly present their parent with a stack of cut up paper. And I would love to say that after six weeks, I realized there was this deep spiritual situation going on for this child. I have no idea. I have no idea what was happening for that child. And I never will. And I might always remember him and his, you know, really dedication to that paper cutting that lasted weeks. Um, but that's that's one of the things that's really different. There's not necessarily a product always at the end of godly play to show um, specifically to parents to say like this is this is the checklist of what was learned or this is what was done or here's the handout or here's the the craft that related to the story. Um, it's very oriented in process. Um, the flow of knowledge and then you know is different that um, we're all the mutual learning, we're all, all there together in that learning process. As Keith mentioned, the design of this space. Um, back to mutual learning, when I was um, a student in divinity school, I was working specifically at a church with a group of uh, fifth graders doing godly play. It was all, there's like maybe like eight fifth graders doing godly play together. And um, they ask such fantastic questions that multiple times I had to say, you know what, I'm gonna have to do some research on that. And I will ask my student professor and I will come back next week and I will, I will I'll tell you what I learned. Um, and one child asked such a great question that I actually wrote a whole paper on it in seminary. We were talking about uh, Jesus and the faces of Easter was the story and, we go all the way, you know, to the cross and to the resurrection. And this child said, well, why did Jesus have to die? Like, why couldn't God just take Jesus up to heaven before the crucifixion? Didn't God know the crucifixion was coming? Couldn't God just take Jesus up to heaven before the crucifixion? Why did Jesus have to die? And I like had nothing to say really in that moment. Um, and I wrote a whole paper about it because wow, what a fantastic question to wrestle with. And so that child's question led to my deep exploration and learning. I still don't really have a great answer for that. You'll have to ask uh, Keith <laughs> later about that one. <laughs> um, the design of the space as we, as we talked about, um, and as uh, Deborah mentioned, the open-ended prompts. Um, so all wondering questions, all questions that are in the curriculum of godly play are open-ended, like really questions that do not have one right answer. Like the idea is to uh, foster deep curiosity and deep engagement in the children with the story to help them connect with it uh, deeply. And then to like engage in reflection together. And there's often times where I will say, wow, I wonder about that too. And leave it at that. Or that's that's something that we can really wonder about together. Or I, yeah, that's so interesting. And also I wonder. And so it just kind of iterates. Um, and then that broad goal of building capacity for that theological reflection, which really just means the capacity to like think deeply about God and reflect together. Uh, so I'm sure there's more to say about, about what makes godly play unique, um, but those are what y'all said and these, this is what I would have to add to that one. Awesome, thank you. Um, the second question is, how does this curriculum support neurodivergent kids? Sorry, can you start that question op over? You, dear, you didn't come in right away. Oh, sure. Yeah. So the second question is, how does this curriculum godly play support neurodivergent kids? That's a really good question. 
Um, and I will preface this by saying I'm not an expert in working with kids with neurodivergency and have not parented a, a neurodivergent kid. Um, so this is just, certainly I have worked in godly play circles where, where there are kids with neurodivergency. Um, and what I think, some ways that I think godly play supports those kids are um, back to choice to have the wide variety of response materials available is such a gift. And it means that different kids can make different choices uh, based on what, what works for them. And it also, as leaders, it gives a lot of flexibility for adding things that work for particular kids. So there's a lot of flexibility for a godly play um, mentor to ask the parents, hey, you know, here are some ideas for response time. Are these going to work for your kid? If not, do you have some other ideas about what might be meaningful for them during their response time? And then being able to add that um, to the classroom. So that's one. The second one is um, movement. So there's there's a movement in terms of, you know, you come in, you do sit in a circle and hear a lesson and wonder together, but then there's the movement pretty quickly out into doing your work. And sometimes you have a child who will select one thing and work with it for 15 minutes. Sometimes you have a child that will do five different things in that 15 minutes. And like both of those things are okay. Um, and so it's not, we're not on the same timeline during that response time where everybody is sitting at the table doing a thing that you hope takes the same amount of time. So there's some flexibility there. And there's also that movement of getting up, moving around, coming back to the circle. There's certainly the opportunity to add things like I do a lot of singing in my godly play class. Um, sometimes there's marching or clapping or um, egg shakers, depending on um who is in the circle. And then I would say that godly play can be adapted to support neurodivergent kids in similar ways to any other curriculum. So I think a lot of it is relational. Um, so having the godly play mentor get to know the child, get to know the family, and parents often um, are the real experts about what is going to work well for their child. And so leaning on them to help um, tell us as the leaders what is going to work well in that, in that space. There's certainly opportunity for a child to sit um, closer to the door or to sit outside the circle if that works better. Or I've seen um, some circles have those balls that like expand and contract. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but um, have a child hold something during the story, like all of that is sort of available as adaptation um, in godly play. Great, thank you. All right, the third question that we have for you, we'll see if um, Reagan or Steph or Keith has any, or if I have any questions too. Um, how can parents support what um, is happening in a godly place classroom at home? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, and I'm glad that one comes up because <laughs> it's wonderful. So I would say um, the first thing is sort of, uh, I've done some work in uh, parents and spirituality and raising spiritual children. And I think the biggest thing parents can do is nourish their own spiritual lives um, because kids are watching us and they're taking note of what we value and what we spend time on and what's important to us. So if that is visible in parents' life, that is gonna come across to a, to a child. And then I would say um, in terms of specifically reinforcing what we're doing in godly play, is leaning into those open-ended questions. And you can even borrow a lot of the language from Godly Play. I have another, I think I have another slide to show you on that. Um, because wondering, which is what we call it in Godly Play, how we sort of think about these stories together, wondering is really not the same thing as asking questions. Um, because again, it's um, it's mutual learning. 
So wondering, like we've said, is open-ended. There's no, there's no one right answer. Um, and it does not need to be rushed. And that's actually a really hard one I'm realizing as a parent, um, because a lot of times we're in a hurry and sometimes questions don't come at the most ideal moment when we're ready to have a deep conversation <laughs> or think things through. Um, but I think that can be a spiritual practice. In a godly play circle, um, we have the time that we need to have these conversations. And so how can we practice that at our own dinner tables or in our cars? Um, practice, not like perfect, but how can we practice that? Um, wondering questions, explore feelings and facts. Um, and when we wonder, we don't need answers. I think that's a really hard one uh, for us as adult humans. We want to know the answers, especially if the child is asking something important, but often it's enough for the child and their spiritual journey to simply affirm, wow, I hear you. That's a really good question. I wonder about that too. Um, and then turning the question around, what do you think about that? Um, so I would say practicing some wondering together at home would be a really beautiful way to support what's happening in the godly play class. And you could even share some of those questions that are at the end of sacred stories, the wondering props, prompts with parents. I wonder what part of the story you like best. I wonder what part might be the most important. I wonder what part of this story is for you, especially for you today or where you can see yourself in this story. And then I wonder if we could leave out anything and still have everything we need. Those are four wondering questions with every sacred story that are pretty much applicable to like most anything in life. Um, wonder what part of your day you liked best. I wonder what part of your day you could have left out and still had everything you needed. <laughs> um, so that's what I've got on, yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and Keith, before you turn off the recording, is there anything you want me to go back through the slides and, and say before you turn off the recording? Or do you feel like we covered the big picture? I think, I think we've covered it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. And yeah, now we'll just, um, we'll, we'll kind of stop recording here. And so uh, just any responses, questions, reactions, um, you know, uh, would be great. So just we'll just open it up. If anybody has any thoughts?